The Aeolian harp goes on a kind of philosophical journey which is comparable to the overall directions of several of the other conversation poems. For that reason, I want to look more closely at how the sequence of repose, philosophical conjecture, and final return to indolence has been framed. The philosophical flight of the poem rises with Coleridge's rush of enthusiasm for the ideas of pantheism and is grounded by Sarah's scepticism. It's like the trajectory of a rocket. The excitable Coleridge needs another voice to regulate his philosophical explorations. This is not just in case he says the wrong thing, such as endorsing a controversial religious perspective, as here, but as a structural device. Coleridge uses other voices to give shape to poetic musings that risk becoming too abstract in subject, and consequently directionless and shapeless as poetry. I labour this point because it's a principle that shapes all of the conversation poems and occurs in different forms throughout Coleridge's works as he's constantly searching for the device that will regulate him, keep him in order. The Nightingale was first written in 1798, the Annus Mirabilis in which Coleridge kept almost constant company with the Wordsworths. And this poem, Birdsong, causes Coleridge to reflect on the character of a poet. Again, he introduces things that will contain his sentiments, limit them, to prevent him from rambling abstractly and endlessly. Temporally, it's late, and he's aware that it's nearly time to rest. This puts a limit on the scope of a poem, which follows the course of an evening walk. He refers to contrasting literary uses of the nightingale for perspective on the bird as symbol for the poet. These oppositions give structure to Coleridge's reflections. Similar to Sarah's role in the Aeolian Harp, William and Dorothy Wordsworth appear in the nightingale not merely as addressees, but as living presences who shape Coleridge's thoughts in formation. We see them reacting. Coleridge describes how they are responding to the things he says to them. From these examples, you can see there's a more complex arrangement of voices in the Nightingale than in the Aeolian Harp, in which Sarah simply represents a religious opposition to Coleridge's views. As at the outset of the Aeolian Harp, Coleridge is in repose when a new stimulus catches his attention. In this case, it is birdsong rather than the music of a wind harp. Coleridge, the reader of literature, commences dialogue with Coleridge, the lover of nature. He quotes the description of the nightingale as the most musical, most melancholy bird from John Milton. Literary tradition has held that the nightingale is a melancholy bird, something which jars with Coleridge's own perception of the bird song, which the poet says himself is merry. This is another of Coleridge's polarities. The conflicting assessments of the nightingale as melancholy and merry occasion his contemplation of how the bird is perceived, the psychology of authors who write about it, and therefore the nature of poets themselves. Over the course of the poem, he assembles a kind of dossier of nightingales, literary examples, those present to hand, and those reported anecdotally, which he juxtaposes, probing all the while at what each representation of the nightingale reveals concerning the literary imagination. Coleridge's main finding in this poem is that poets have too often echoed the conceit of colouring the forms of nature inappropriately with their own gloom, which they carry within them. They ignore the voices of nature and turn natural objects into their ventriloquist dummies. The alternative is for the poet to allow nature to speak through him, surrendering his whole spirit, to quote the poem. This is a similar pantheistic idea to the Aeolian harp metaphor. But here Coleridge is not rebuffed by his disapproving wife. Here, the opposition Coleridge encounters comes from literary tradition. In Philomela's pity pleading strains, he cites another famous literary figure who contributes to the Nightingale's pessimistic associations. In Ovid's account, Philomela is imprisoned by her brother-in-law who removes her tongue. She escapes and gets revenge, and as her brother-in-law pursues her, she transforms into a nightingale, regaining her freedom. So this conversation poem moves back and forth like an argument. Milton tells us that nightingales are melancholy. Coleridge feels this is untrue. Then the allusion to Philomela in Ovid's Metamorphoses appears to validate the popular use of the nightingale as a symbol for sadness. But Coleridge contests this idea again, this time invoking supportive voices. His companions, the Wordsworths, share his different lore. They are careful not to profane nature's sweet voices. 
The kinship that Coleridge establishes between the poet and the bird is not melancholy, but joyous. As in the Aeolian harp, the poet is reluctant to leave off the reflections inspired by the song of the nightingale. He uses the word farewell three times, but continues for another verse paragraph. Like the earlier poem, another human presence is required to close this poem, to conclude Coleridge's philosophical venture. In this poem, it is his infant son, Hartley, who urges Coleridge to be silent, to appreciate the nightingale without endless conjecture on pantheism and the imagination and humanity's relationship to nature. Notice that, as with Sarah's sharp look in the Aeolian harp, it's a silent action that hushes the poet, the infant raising his little forefinger and bidding the poet be still and listen. By now, the shape and processes of these conversation poems should be familiar. Frost at Midnight is another poem from 1798. Again, the poet begins in serene contemplation when a new stimulus catches his attention. In this poem, we find Coleridge seated by the fire. In that solitude, he writes, that suits abstruse musings. Reporting the spread of frost outside, Coleridge detects a subtle presence at work in the fireplace. This is another kind of communion with nature the dim sympathy, he calls it, with the chemical reaction that is a fire. When Coleridge describes the trace of the fire as the sole unquiet thing, he uses a phrase with which he describes himself in other poems. Therefore, the fire becomes a companionable form, as he puts it. The still blue flame redirects Coleridge's thoughts. This time, he's not in dialogue with literature or philosophy, but superstition that this phenomenon is an omen, which signifies an eminent visitor. For this reason, he refers to the film of flame itself as that fluttering stranger. Coleridge's psychological associations are with childhood. He recalls times during his unhappy years at boarding school when he would observe the same film of flame, which he calls a stranger. But the prospect of receiving a visitor doesn't appeal to Coleridge. He remembers his desire to be the visitor or wanderer. But the escapist fantasy is tainted by another ominous voice, one that reports the voice of being eternally a stranger. As in the Nightingale, the infant Hartley is one of the responsive presences in this poem. When the poet notices the breath of his sleeping son, he ceases his melancholy reverie. The conversational lapses in the text are filled in by the infant's breathings. Hartley's presence informs the momentary pauses, as though he's needed by the poem to complete its poetic metre. The wandering stranger Coleridge now communicates a sense of community, togetherness. He imagines a future for Hartley by lakes and sandy shores, beneath the crags of ancient mountain and beneath the clouds. Wordsworth's voice arises here too. Coleridge had never actually visited the Lake District at the time of composing this poem, so his vision of his son's future there relies on descriptions of the area provided by his friend.